three, take one. Well, first thing that occurs to me is that in terms of the amount, the amount of time you've been involved in doing what you're doing, it's practically impossible to ask you a question you haven't been asked before about education. But I'd like to begin by asking you if there are any antagonists that you have faced in the course of your educational career for whom you have had a degree of respect and who might even have taught you something? I can't remember any antagonists. Possibly I keep out of the way. I, I, there must be many amount of people who think I'm mad or, or dangerous or something. I never hear about them. I don't know them. I've, I've never had any antagonism from the Ministry of Education or the Church or anybody else. I can't think of any antagonists. I've had reviews, <coughs> you know, and hostile reviews and the other kind, but uh, I've never paid much attention to them. No, no I, I don't think, I, I'm rather surprised that I haven't had. Maybe I think I'm not a very aggressive person. Uh, I don't think I am. Uh, and I don't get people's backs up, you see. Uh, so that, <laughs> no, I, I don't know the answer to that question, really. Are there any people whom you have encountered and had discussions with who are educationalists themselves, who subscribe to different beliefs than yours, who have seemed to you to put uh, reasonable points of view? No, well, it's a difficult question because, you see, <coughs> it, teachers, educationists are interested in learning. And to me, learning is a secondary thing in, in my school. Uh, the, we make living the standard, not learning. The learning's there, of course. And half a dozen this week are sitting O levels because they want to go to college. But that's only incidental. And so that when I meet teachers, uh, I, I feel rather um, a fish out of water because the standard. Put it this way I write quite a lot for the Times Educational System, um, Supplement. And uh, I often write, as you can imagine, rather provocative articles about, edu about children, not about education, but uh, I don't know what education is. All I know is what it isn't. And uh, uh, nobody replies. <coughs> and I tried the experiment once of writing about the teaching of English, and any amount of replies. English was important, psychology, and children, the nature of children wasn't. So I, I'm rather out of touch with teachers for that reason, I think. But the, the, that journal is full of learning and teachers meeting and salaries and discipline and all the rest of it. All things that are outside my problems. I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in them. When you started Summerhill, did you have a concept then of what your priorities were going to be? And did experience teach you to change those priorities in any way? That's not very easy to do, to answer, because I don't know why I started. You see, I, my father was a British schoolmaster in Scotland, and I served my apprenticeship for four years with him, and then sat an examination to get into a training college. 104 men sat as 103rd on the list, so I couldn't get in. Uh, so that... Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm... Well, well you know, I've just... But, but what, was your, what were your priorities oh, yes. when you started your own school? That I don't know. I, I began when I was headmaster of Gretna Green. I began to question the whole thing then. Uh, that was just the beginning of the war. And uh, seeing these children learning quadratic equations and going out to plough the fields, it all seemed futile. And, uh, and, but uh, you never know why you do a thing. You never know why you, uh, why you, uh, you get an idea. But since then on, uh, I've never hesitated, I've never doubted <laughs> the value of people being, in, children being allowed to grow in their own way without being indoctrinated by religion or discipline or politics or anything else. And I've never even questioned that. I've never in all my life, an inspector of schools who have been inspected in these last two days, he asked me if I changed in any way. I said, not in fundamentals. I've never doubted the idea that children in a school like mine in the house should govern themselves, make their own laws with the staff, with equal votes, and be free to go to lessons or stay away. And nobody preaches any morality to them at any time. We don't tell them how to live. I've never doubted that at all. The only thing I've changed in is the fact that uh, 
I was psychoanalyzed myself for a long time when I was in Vienna and in London. And I thought, like all young fools, I thought analysis was the answer, you see. Make the unconscious conscious and the world will be paradise. And of course it was all nonsense. But I never doubted the fact that psychology had shown that the emotions are much more important than the intellect. And I've never gone back in that, and I wouldn't go back in that. I would, I'd never. Uh, oh, no, to get the point about the analysis, when I got all the so many crooks, when I began, I couldn't get anybody else, of course, and I got crooks chucked out of other schools for stealing. And uh, I began to analyze them, you <laughs> see, Freudian way. I was very proud after uh, two years, a boy maybe chucked out of a public school went out cured, and then it dawned upon me that Jimmy and Lizzie had been also checked out of schools for stealing, and they wouldn't come near me for analysis, and they went out cured. So uh, I decided that analysis wasn't doing it, it was freedom was doing it, and I think it's a very optimistic thing to say, because to say that you can analyze the world is absolute nonsense, and it's never been any very successful. No. I use practical methods, I mean, these days, when I had so many crooks, and I got a thief chucked out of a public school. When the first time he stole, I gave him six to reward. And the second time, I gave him a bob. I expect I'd have to make five bob that today. And uh, it was the beginning of a cure, because um, I was convinced, and I am yet, that a pathological young thief is always an unloved child, but not loved at home. And at the home, he gets scoldings, at school, he gets the cane. He gets hate all the time, he becomes worse. So I gave him a symbol of love, I gave him sixpence. And it was, I still think that I would do that yet, but I'm not taking crooks like that now. I've had enough of them, but I think, I'm not quite sure if it worked today. Children will be too sophisticated, I don't know. I'm talking too much, huh? No, you're not. Uh, I'd, just, I'd just like to take you up on one thing, not take you up, but just question a little further on one thing. Uh -huh. uh, when you refer to sixpence as a symbol of love, mm -hmm. uh, do you mean to a certain type of person at a certain age? Yes, I don't think you would go into dark mood and give a chap five bob and, and, you know, and cure him. Of course, no, no, that's only children you can do that. And you can only do it. One woman wrote me many years ago and said, I've read in one of your books that when children steal, you get a reward. My boy's stealing from Woolworths. He's ten. I've been giving him six months of it, and his story's got worse. I said, yes, but he's not, I can give a child a symbol of love, but your boy doesn't want a symbol, he wants love. Take him on your knee and pet him. Be on his side, as Homer Lane put it. But I never heard what happened. But anyhow. Now, you yourself are a, a non-religious person, brought up in a religious background. Yeah. What happens, how do you cope with a child who comes to you new from a religious background? I don't remember her getting one. I got a Catholic boy a few, two, three years ago. I took him grudgingly. I liked the boy. He has a, a very good problem. And I took him on condition that he didn't go to confession. And I found that when he went home, he went to confession. And I said, well, I can't have this. I said to his parents, you can't have two systems. It's not fair to the boy. And we don't believe in sin. He's going to confess his sin. There's no good. And as a rule, as you can imagine, Bernard, we don't get children from religious homes. We don't get people who... No. No. So the question doesn't usually arise. It doesn't usually arise. No. Uh, now, in terms of the kind of thing that gets you publicity, um, which is the unorthodox things about nudity and bathrooms and uh, masturbation, things of this kind, which I would think are the sort of things you get sick of being asked about. but. Could you put that sort of thing in some kind of perspective for me in terms of the actual work you're doing? Well, every child, uh, if I get a child who's obviously got a complex and uh, guilt about masturbation, I uh, try to tell the child, um, it's all bunk, he's going to go mad, he's going to be impotent, so on. I said, it's just a fallacy. And I get hold of the parents and I said, you put the full water on, you're the people that take it off. Yeah. But that very seldom happens. They, 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 we had a debate. We had a debate every Tuesday night in the winter time, and we discussed a debate on masturbation one night. And the children were very, very sensible about it. 
it's awfully difficult to know because you see we're living in an anti-sex world and as you can imagine as you can see the BBC had a hundred phone calls over that program the other night because my children were bathing naked we're an anti-sex society obviously it's the only thing that's repressed uh, other things you can eat as much as you like <laughs> um, but uh, and uh, I, we don't fight it really, we simply try to bring our children so that sex will not be a sin or guilty or anything else. Now, when you talk about the, we don't live in a free society, it's supposed to be a free school. Uh, again, this is a question you've obviously had to deal with many times. But what is your answer when people say to you, right, you're bringing up children in a freer way than society subscribes to at this point, aren't you running the risk of, when those children leave your school, subjecting them to pressures that they should be aware of? Yes, I've had that question many a time. One answer is, in 47 years, I know of only one ex-pupil who couldn't hold a job. Uh, that's, a, that's an external sort of thing. They adapt themselves because they've got the guts, you know, and like we all do. I mean, royalty doesn't mean a thing to me. In fact, I'd abolish royalty for the Queen's sake. I think it's a, that poor woman has a hell of a life. But when the, play, the band plays God Save the Queen, I stand up. What's the good of protesting against a thing like that? So they adapt themselves and do. It's like taking your hat off to a lady. Uh, which is a, a sham because it, it covers the fact that in a patriotic society a woman is of no importance, she doesn't get the same money. If a duke has six daughters and a son is born, he gets the title. So we overcompensate by pretending women are something wonderful. And I, uh, I do it, but I, I feel all the time that uh, it's a swindle. So they do the same, they have to fit in. And um, to begin with, I think when they leave, they, uh, they associate quite a lot together. Every October, on my birthday, they have a big party, a dance in London with 200 people there, lots of them old people. And they, they just adapt themselves like other people. They've got the guts to do it, they've got the balance, they've got the sincerity, I think. Mind you, they don't like the outside world any more than you and I do. They see what's wrong with it. Does the kind of free upbringing that they get in your school, do you think, help them to make the kind of protest that you feel should be being made in society more effectively than other people who are simply trying to find a way of express, uh, expressing a uh, dissent. Well, that brings up an interesting fact um, that people have often criticized. My old pupils are not rebels. They don't go out waving flags. Uh, I was, I'm the only summer Hillian who's spent a couple of nights in a police cell in Glasgow sitting down and protesting against the Polaris base. They don't do that, the way of see Andy badges. But I said to one old people, a scientist, I said, uh, do you, do you th I gave him this criticism that they don't seem to do. He says, well, uh, we do it, I, I do it myself, he says, uh, I use summer Hill mainly in bringing up my own family. And uh, I make friends with people who think of them and feel very much about life as, as I do. So it brings up the, the rather awkward question as, as reformers and pioneers, people who've had to go through the mud, as Shelley puts it, most wretched men are cradled into poetry through wrong. They, teach in, they learn in suffering what they teach in a song. I rebelled against the discipline, the Calvinistic discipline of Scotland. I don't know why, other people I knew didn't. So that um, you'd find possibly most rebels that they have, uh, they've gone through something that made them want something really salient and something, inter something fundamental. But my children don't do that. I don't, I don't know, some of them, I think, uh, unfortunately, they, none of them ever make any money. They're never going for business. I used to daydream of one becoming a tycoon and down the school, but of course, if, uh, knowing all the time that if he was a tycoon, he'd be so hard-boiled, he wouldn't have done anything. That brings up a, a point that fascinates me personally. Um, you've made the point more than once that uh, 
And I agree that uh, too great a percentage of our humor in this country uh, is based on a kind of double standard about sex and lavatories. And uh, we obliquely make jokes about bedrooms and lavatories, which get enormous laughs from people who are inhibited yeah. basically about them. Now, I think you made the point at one point that you, you once tried writing a little play along these lines, but that with your, with your students, that kind of humor doesn't mean anything. It isn't funny to them because they live naturally. What sort of humor comes out of them instead of that? What do they find funny? I don't think children, as a rule, have humor. They're fun. It's more fun with... It's more... Well, humor's more light to wit, I think, but uh, it's difficult to know. You get kids who seem to have a born sense of humor. Uh, the interesting thing is that when I get children to modern schools, they have no humor at all. There's no fun. The other day I got a boy, a new boy, an American boy of 10, and he was standing at the front door, and he'd been with us for about six weeks, and I came up and I said, uh, I'm looking for Neil, do you know how I can find him? And he stuck to just me as if I was mad, and he said, you're Neil. Well, David Barton, who is now professor of mathematics in London University, when he was seven, I said to him one day, they lived in a cottage uh, over the way, and I said, hey, you, Run over to the cottage and tell David Barton I want to see him. He went over. He's only seven. He came back in five minutes. He says, David Barton says he doesn't want to see you. <laughs> now, that was, <laughs> that, that was a, an inborn sense of humor, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. But they don't laugh. They think if a chamber pot's shown in a local cinema, the whole lot going to, the whole house goes into giggles. And our kid wonder why. It doesn't mean anything to me. It's the same with the sex question, I think. They're pretty healthy about sex, I think. Well, occasionally you, you find the four-letter word just curled up in the wall. But, uh, what happens when they go home, say, for the summer, <coughs> and find themselves using the four-letter words with the uh, neighborhood kids? That's a bit awkward with young children, especially the young ones. They go home six and seven, and they have, have the sophistication to hide the fact that the neighbors next door hastily take their children in and won't let them play with them. You get that occasionally, not very often. But I tell in one of my books about a girl, I think she was about seven. She was packing one day to go home at the end of term, and I got in her way, and she said, get out of my way, you bugger. So I stopped, and I said, me and I said, your mother sent you to Summerhill, not your father. If you go home calling your father a bugger, he'll take you away. And she didn't say anything. At the end of the holidays, after two months, they come back. Her elder sister, age 15, said, Neil, odd thing happened at home. Collie never swore once. So at that age, she had the sophistication to know. Yeah? Yeah, they learn very quickly. That yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's not a big problem. Four-letter words in themselves are, are, of course, unimportant, which is part of your point. Of course. Do yeah. you find as the children grow older, they say they use them less and less? They, I never hear them, uh, uh, very seldom. Uh, this is a TV program, so I can't say what they're saying. Yes, you can. Um, well, uh, the American children, for example, has, uh, get, uh, they're very fond of the word fuck. They're always saying fuck off. You see, because in America, apparently, uh, that's a much more heinous sort of word than it is here. And you get that, and occasionally you get it scribbled in the wall, but of course nobody cares. Damn, nobody's interested. If, uh, do the, um, now, th there's a thing that uh, I mentioned to you at lunch we had with Marguerite Lasky where, about men calling one another cunts. Now, American, American men, I think, don't do that. Do American children, what about American children with that They word? don't see it either. I never hear the word in some of I used to hear it in a Scottish village. I mean, it was always applied to a man. Oh, he's a cunt. That means he was a nasty bugger, so to speak. But uh, they never use it. I never hear them use it in some of at all. I don't know whether it's, maybe the new generation doesn't know much about it. But no, carry on. No, I don't think, um, I have nothing more to say about that. I think that, uh, right. I've often said, by the way, I've written that, um, I wonder how much the four-letter word is a matter of snobbery, because you see, the, a navvy uses the Anglo-Saxon word fuck, and a, a gentleman is saying sexual intercourse. I'm not quite sure, but I don't know how much the upper classes are. 
in court circles use these terms, I don't know. Well, Never having mixed in them. We have, will we have a time for color test? Okay. Good. Free. Now, all, all I really want to do now is to get down to what you consider to be the fundamental things, because this is really what is important. The others are peripheral. What are the fundamental things that you're aiming for? I want to see a world that has less hate in it and, and crime, brutality, and cruelty to children. I'm asking far too much, of course. I know I can't see it in my time. I don't know when I have to ever come. You see, I can't imagine children who brought up freely like, like my children are ever being anti-Semitic or anti-Negro or anything like that. I couldn't imagine any of them following a Hitler. Uh, they've got the, a peaceful view of life, uh, an attitude that's uh, of calm, I think. Uh, and kindliness, and, and especially sincerity. Uh, for example, when we had B that BBC program, uh, they told the photographers, "No, we don't want anything faked. We're not going to. We're not going to pretend we're doing something we're not." They've got that very strongly. So, I'm only a very small atom in a great big hateful world. So as you are, and we can only do our little bit to try and ameliorate. Uh, this universal misery, uh, and uh, we're mostly unconscious of it. I read a, that book the other day, Last Exit to Brooklyn, and I wrote an article for the Times Supplement saying that that book should never have been banned because it paints a dreadful picture of a, a society we know nothing about. And these people who've been through state schools and the, the sexist pornography and brutality and uh, there's no vocabulary, and uh, uh, everything is brutal about it. And we, the, the world should know about these things, and then they're going to censor the book. Uh, it's awfully difficult to know, just put in a, in a few words what I'm really trying to do. Uh, uh, in a way, it's Christianity, uh, uh, real Christianity. As Nietzsche said, uh, the first and last Christian was crucified on the cross. I think he was right. But Christianity, if it were Christianity, would be rather like, well, a, a priest once said to me in English, Church of England priest has said, I think Summerhill is the most religious school in England. And I think he was right in this way, that the only solution for humanity is, is love instead of hate. I hate the word using love because it's become a dirty word nowadays. But uh, approval is possibly better approval of children instead of hating them and, and molding them. But as I say, we're a very small unit. It's growing slowly. Uh, as, as I was saying this afternoon, a lot of schools in America found in this on Summerhill, private school. But there's so little in the LBGs and the Hal Wilsons and people, they have the power. And I think it's a terrible thought that the, the people of the Pentagon, for example, hateful men, most of them I expect, have the power to press a button, and we have no, we have no control of our lives, or our children's lives at all. No, it's a difficult question. Man. I'm a pessimist very often when I read about these, these um, secret gases, the nerve gases, and things like that. And see Vietnam and uh, and uh, Israel, and Arabs, and things. I get quite pessimistic. I never get pessimistic about kids. I never despair of a child. I know that in the end he'll come right, or she'll come right. Well, if it would seem to me that if the sort of peace you aim for in the school comes about, is there a danger that I'm not now talking about ambition, but that does it in any way undermine personal incentive? Well, I can answer that in one way. In We've got a professor of mathematics who's got a, a reader of history who refused a professorship. We've got a 
chess specialists, we've got surgeons, we've got doctors, we've got lawyers, scientists, who all were free to go to lessons or stay away, and they had the guts to do what they wanted to do. I'm only talking about the job aspect. And so as far as that's concerned, freedom can lead to, to success in a job line. One boy who had no academic brains became a bricklayer, and he's quite happy as a bricklayer. I think he's going to start his own business soon. And, um, but then the other side, I don't know anything about their emotional life. I don't, know, I don't go inquiring about whether they're happily married or not. But I should be very surprised and disappointed if any of my old pupils hit their children or, or gave them a sense of guilt about God or sex or anything else. I'm pretty sure they won't. But it's a very small beginning. But if you have, um, if you say, and I agree with you, for her own sake, perhaps we should uh, relieve the queen of her responsibilities. Somebody will always have to take the responsibilities of a Harold Wilson, of an L.B. Johnson. Yeah. Is there anybody going to emerge from your environment who is going to be prepared to take on that responsibility? No, I'm, Bernard, I'm afraid they're too honest, man. Too honest to become politicians. Huh? I really, I'm serious about that. You take a politician, for example, who's got a, a constituency of Catholics or Baptists, uh, he comes up against an abortion bill or something, he daren't vote for it. It's a very dirty game, politics, of course it is. No, I don't think I would But as you say, somebody have to do it. I don't know. You see, communism, I thought, to begin with, I thought the, when the Russian Revolution came, that the salvation of the world would come in the school who were all summer hills, freedom and self-government. And then gradually it became what it is today, simply uh, an authoritative character-molding community. I don't know what the answer is about that. Is there anything that you think parents can do short of putting their children into summer hill? Because there isn't enough of summer hill to go around. And there are an oh, awful no. lot of parents with children and problems. That's a difficult question for parents because um, they're sending their kids to state schools or other schools where they're being indoctrinated in some way and made afraid very often and punished very often. It's also difficult for parents. Uh, I, I, I can't generalize about it. In my own case, I've been married twice. And my, with my second wife, I had a daughter who's now 21, who's now interested in teaching children how to ride horses. And we never had any trouble with her. I mean, it was a give and take. She was what we call self-regulated. She could choose very much her own food, and we didn't try to put her on the pot when she was a baby and let her come to it herself. We never lectured her, never gave her. We had to say no, of course, as you'd have to say with a kid. I had to say, come on, you can't play with my typewriter. And, uh, and on the other hand, she said, you can't play with my things, which is quite right. But uh, I think it's possible if you're oriented, if you if you've got a, a sort of balance in yourself, if you've got a quietness in yourself, if you've got a sort of world philosophy of of living your own life and letting other people live theirs. That's all Summer Hill is, really. I have a chapter in my last book talking of Summer Hill about the self-regulated child. I can't remember what I said, so I can't repeat it. But I think I said there, you can't have a self-regulated child if you're an unbalanced person, if you're religious, or if you get into a fuss of a child breaks something and things like that, or if a, a, a woman, a mother, is fussy about whether they've sex play or, or mess their pants or something, you can't have sex regulation because she flies off the handle. And what I'm, the ideal mother would be and father would be a very peaceful people who who didn't fly off the handle. I very seldom fly off the handle myself. I'm not boasting, but it's just my temperament. Uh, How much of it do you think has to do with the amount of time one has to give to one's children? A lot. A lot. I think I feel that. And next time all I read about the American families, the middle classes, where the women are frigid or se sex starved, because the father's in the office all day making money and he comes home tired man and the kids are just in his way. I think an awful lot is due to, to the, the work question that the, the people are outside. 
And I think the children get too much with the mother and too little with the father. I think I proved that because many years. A father and a mother, and a brothers and sisters, with sexual organs, of course, and change of clothes. And when, when with neurotic children, and small children, I just used to lay them on the floor, you see, and there's daddy, there's mummy. And mummy was kicked to death in six weeks. I had to keep renewing it. They never touched her all bad. So that Freud's, <laughs> Freud's theory of the Oedipus complex <laughs> seems to be wonky in some way. No, I think that it, 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 you're quite right there. There is something about the fact that that your main job in life is earning a living, and your children are sort of subsidiary in a way. They have to give way to that. They have to be quiet when father comes home. He's tired from the office. I think a lot of that. It's not the fault of the parents, but I think it's just the economic circumstances. That's See, we can do it because it's our job. I mean, we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's just